empirically an enormous value and may help people to live less self-centered and more charitable lives and more understanding lives. Also, I would give uh, this session to, to a friend or to someone who wanted, and the preparation for the session was very, very careful. The, the day before, we didn't do anything. We just fixed the house very quietly. The day of the session, there was nothing except that, and even the day after. So there was a three-day thing because, uh, as Aldous wrote in Ireland, the session is a, a gratuitous grace. It's what you take away from there, a gratuitous grace. Something is given to you for nothing. Not that you merit it. You just are lucky and get it. But what you do with it afterwards is what counts. Nothing is easier than to formulate high ideals, but few things are more difficult than to uh, discover the means whereby those ideals may be implemented. One has to dream, but one has to dream in a pragmatic way. I think Huxley enjoyed Hubbard. Hubbard was very excited about the potential of LSD. He felt a mission to the world to bring this and have it spread. One of the things that the two of us planned was to hopefully reach the place where we could set up treatment centers around the world. Eventually, Al set up a place in Vancouver, which was a place to uh, give people LSD with a proper kind of setting to make people feel at home and, and encourage them. When the person was accepted to go through the program, he was uh, given an outline to write his history, what problems he had, if he had any health problems, what was the relationship with his parents, what was his childhood like. So then uh, they came to the session and some introductory remarks were made. The importance, for example, of just releasing to the experience and knowing that they had help and could ask questions. And then they were administered LSD. And then we would uh, lie them down on the couch. We put headphones on them and encourage an internal journey. And uh, then we would put on music. And uh, we would keep playing the music. And uh, usually it's been the first two, three, maybe even four hours there. And that's what we wanted, for them to go deeply into themselves and explore. Of course, we were taking notes and we had a tape recorder so that everything that was said was recorded. Can I come up for a minute? Certainly, David. So then after four, maybe five hours, so they would feel like coming out and sitting up, so we began to talk. That was magnificent. We would show them pictures of the family so that they could look at them and spend time with them, which is probably, probably the most important part of the session for people who were there for therapeutic reasons. Hubbard was very ingenious at working out things that uh, promoted the effectiveness of the uh, LSD experience. One of them he came up with was the strobe, and he found that if the strobe light, if you get it pretty close to the alpha rhythm, produced it very weird effects. It does anyway as a natural strobe. When you combine that with LSD, it's really very remarkable. Looking into the mirror is one of the most powerful things you can do, to look at yourself. And of course, at first, some people really draw back, you know. I've seen people even frightened at the image of their mirror, but we encourage them, just look, just accept it. And as they do, they begin to see more and more. And uh, if they go far enough with this, they begin to see their inner self. One of the most powerful artifacts that you can show to a person when they're under the influence 
is a beautiful red rose that's just uh, partly open. It hasn't fully opened yet. For many, the rose comes to life and they actually see it breathe. They, they can actually see the petals open and close. We would always have arranged for a sitter to take them home and the sitter would take them home and sit with them until they went to sleep. Uh, people had a sense of being dropped. Uh, they came for a few times afterwards, and uh, then we didn't see them anymore, and we paid such close attention to them ahead of time that they felt sort of neglected. There were several people who'd gone through the process who were sort of typical leader types, and they uh, formed groups so that uh, people could join one of the groups and they would go to the group, say, once a week and they'd share experiences with each other. My feeling was to them is that if you're sort of looking for paradise after this experience, you begin to realize that it's right here. Well, Wherever you happen to be, <clears throat> like where we're sitting. <clears throat> you make your own heaven and hell. It's very important that one is prepared for the use of psychedelics. It is not just fun, it is a very serious uh, experiment. Psychedelics allow you to do things, but you only do the things that you really want to do. And, and if it's something that you don't want to do, then uh, stay away from it. It's not for you. Uh, so intention is the bottom line. As a matter of fact, I think intention is the bottom line in life anyway, for all of us at any time. When you think about ritual, you know, traditional ritual ceremony, that's just the purpose of intentional use of arranging the set and the setting. <laughs> Um, it's not that ritual per se has any value, but it has value depending on the intention and the set and the setting that's behind it. Set is what you bring to the experience. You bring your life experience, you bring your memories, uh, you bring your unconscious material, you bring your aspirations. Some people uh, may have a much better set and sail very smoothly through these experiences. Others may have very difficult sets and may have to work harder and maybe be a lot more uncomfortable before they get things uh, resolved. Uh, setting is also important and setting is the place where you have the experience. It's your surroundings, uh, it's your companions, and these things are very important. The approach to give a LSD session was extraordinarily thought out, careful, respectful, loving, and it's also self-effacing. Because the most difficult thing if you are a guide is not to have opinion, to let the person give whatever he feels, whatever he sees. And. Uh, so it, it was completely different from what happened four years later where that was given in, in its street and it was very upsetting. When the young people started using it, they'd uh, go to a, a party or something and they get stoned out of their gourd and uh, then uh, there was no uh, support system if they freaked out. Uh, and they'd end up in uh, a mental ward somewhere and get a shot of uh, niacin or something to pull them down. And uh, that wasn't... that wasn't very effective way of getting them consider what they were learning. If uh, <clears throat> the setting is threatening and frightening, 
or if the people involved um, suddenly shove off in the middle of it, uh, the, the, the person may get very frightened. And then you've got uh, 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 anxiety which is no longer controlled by the, the normal means of controlling anxiety. It, it just goes on and they may panic. And that, has, of course, has happened. There were places in Canada where they tied people in bed to give them LSD. And I don't know why they would do that, but partly be that came about because the early research with it was uh, done by the American Army, and their aim was altogether different. They wanted to use it as a weapon. And when you start from the weapons approach, uh, it's the confusion and the dis disturbance that you, you're capitalizing on because it, they felt that if you give, give it to a whole population, they'd be pretty well immobilized because people wouldn't be able to carry on in their normal fashion and you just sort of move them out of the road quietly and move in and take over their function and you have a victory with no trouble whatever. Uh, that was the theory, but it, it backfired on the Americans. They uh, found out that when they gave it to the soldiers, first thing the soldiers wanted to do is quit the army. We teach the science and art of ecstasy. We teach people how to turn on or how to go out of their minds. By turn on, we mean um, to tune in, to get beyond your routine uh, ways of thinking and acting and experiencing. In 1961, two of Harvard University's best and brightest minds discovered psilocybin and LSD. Richard Alpert, who later changed his name to Ram Das, and Timothy Leary, along with graduate student Ralph Metzner, began doing psychedelic research on a wide scale, conducting projects with religious leaders and prison communities, among others. Harvard's administration eventually grew uncomfortable with the amount of media attention Leary was receiving and canceled the project. Leary, Alpert and Metzner moved first to Mexico and then to upstate New York to continue working with these substances. We were like middle class academics. And uh, our, our role, I think in retrospect, was to try to find some way that uh, the professional middle class world of psychologists, psychotherapists and so forth could uh, accommodate these experiences. And uh, we tried it within the university setting, and it worked for a while, and certain experiments were done, and we carried out the experiments, and we published articles in the journal, and then after a while it was no longer possible to do that then. Then we experimented with other settings. Uh, we had this LSD training center in Zihuatanejo in Mexico. Where we said, well, let's go into a, you know, where we're freed from the usual constraints, but we, we still have the structure, we just want to explore these potentials of these. In a, in a serious way, it was not just a, an ongoing drug party, and, and uh, it was it was planned. It was you know, attention paid to certain settings and so forth. Um, but then.